Hello, everyone. My name is James Hankin. I'm a professor of biology and also director of the Museum of Comparative Zoology here at Harvard. I'm delighted to welcome you to tonight's Evolution Matters lecture sponsored by the Harvard Museum of Natural History and the Harvard Museums of Science and Culture. Now, some of you may have seen a strange item in the news last month about animals called sea slugs that decapitate themselves and then grow new bodies. So for example, here is the article as it appeared in the New York Times online. I'll read this for you. Meet the sea slugs that chop off their heads and grow new bodies. Their severed heads get around just fine until they regenerate perfectly functioning, parasite-free new bodies, scientists say. Well, after reading that article, you might then have found yourself saying, gee, I wish I could find out more about that phenomenon and meet the people who study that kind of thing. Well, if so, then you're in luck because tonight's speaker, Professor Monsi Srivastava, will describe her research on the evolution of regeneration, the process by which many animals and not just sea slugs are able to regrow body parts that are lost or damaged, or as we've just seen, they choose to discard seemingly voluntarily. However, before I introduce Monsi, I'd like to take a moment to recognize Drs. Herman and Joan Suit for their generous sponsorship of the Evolution Matters lecture series. The Suits have sponsored this series for 12 years, and it is their support that allows us to present and record these lectures. Herman and Joan, if you're listening tonight, thank you very much. And I look forward to seeing you in person, hopefully as soon as next fall. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker. Mansi Srivastava was born and raised in New Delhi, India. She came to the States to attend Mount Holyoke College as an undergraduate and basically has been here ever since. It was while completing her biology degree that she developed a fascination with regeneration. Among other things, she wrote an honors thesis on regeneration in segmented worms. From South Hadley, Massachusetts, she relocated to the University of California at Berkeley, where she received her PhD in molecular and cellular biology by studying comparative genomics of multicellular animals. From Berkeley, Monsi returned to Massachusetts for a postdoc at MIT's Whitehead Institute, where she renewed her study of regeneration, especially its molecular and cellular basis and its evolution among animals. In 2015, Monsi relocated a couple miles down Mass Avenue to join the Harvard faculty in the Department of Organismic and Evolutionary Biology, where she is the John L. Loeb Associate Professor of the Natural Sciences, but also more important to me, the Museum of Comparative Zoology, where she is a curator of invertebrate zoology. While still in the early stage of her career, Monsi has received numerous honors, awards, and accolades for her work. This includes just since her arrival at Harvard, the National Sound Science Foundation Career Award, a National Institutes of Health Maximizing Investigators Research Award, the Smith Family Foundation Award for Excellence in Biomedical Research, a Searle Scholar Award, and the Elizabeth Hay New Investigator Award from the Society for Developmental Biology. What's so special about Monsi's research is that it reveals the molecular mechanisms that underlie regeneration, whose genetic basis has long remained mysterious, but does so in a comparative framework that reveals how it has evolved across millions of years of animal life. Please join me in welcoming Monsi Srivastava. Great, thank you so much for that introduction, Jim. I am very excited um, to be uh, to get this opportunity to talk to everyone here about regeneration, which is one of my favorite phenomena in all of biology, and also to tell you how people in my lab are studying this worm on the left here, the three-banded panther worm, to understand how animals regenerate. So now, when we hear the word regeneration, many of us think of our own bodies and how we can regenerate some 
organs. For example, we can repair our liver, we can regrow our hair, but we don't do more phenomenal types of regeneration because we then also think of things like this newt other or salamanders or lizards, which can regenerate tails. Or if we uh, cut up their arm, for example, as you can watch in this video, the entire arm can grow back. And what's incredible about this process is that this is a really complex organ coming back. There is skin, muscle, blood, all uh, neurons, all kinds of cells coming back. Now, compared to this type of regeneration, which is the regeneration of certain structures, there is an even more marvelous type of regeneration phenomenon out there, which can be seen in many organisms, such as this worm here, which we cut in half, and we can watch both halves fully regrow into beautifully functioning worms. And it's hard to tell by just looking at the surface of the worm, but underneath what this worm is doing is that it is regenerating every single missing cell type. This is a type of regeneration that many of us refer to as whole body regeneration. And my talk will actually focus today on this type of regeneration for two reasons. One, because I think this is an absolutely fascinating process. How do you regrow every single missing cell type? And the second reason is that I think this is a really important first step, which will then, uh, where we study how an animal can regenerate so well, which would then allow us to ask the question of why cannot we regenerate so well? So with these uh, visuals on regeneration in mind, I will introduce you to the two questions that my talk will focus on. First, given that many, many animals regenerate, I will pose the question of whether we can hope to find any universal principles, any common themes that underlie regeneration across animals. And second, um, in the second part of my talk, I will uh, delve into this question of how animals regenerate. I will tell you about how we're learning more about this, particularly focusing on the work going on in my lab on the three-banded panther worm. What I also hope to do in this second part of the talk is give you all a feel for how we do this type of research. So as I mentioned, the uh, newt or the worm you saw on the previous slide are not the only two animals that regenerate. Many, many of them do. And here is just a handful of the beautiful diversity of animal life out there. Not all animals regenerate. So for example, this roundworm does not regenerate much. It can repair its axons when, it ner when its nerves are injured, for example. Other animals, such as the shrimp, the fish, and this newt, can regrow their appendages, like their arms, their fins, etc. But all of the other animals on this slide are capable of whole body regeneration. So this sea star, this hydra, this segmented worm, this acorn worm, this flatworm, this sea squirt, this bryozoan, and this ribbon worm can all regrow all missing cell types. To figure out whether there are any common themes, shared processes that underlie regeneration in these animals, we have to compare the process across these species. And to make these comparisons, we have to think about these animals in the context of their evolutionary relationships to each other. To do that, we have to draw a type of diagram called a phylogenetic tree, uh, which looks uh, like follows. So the tips of this tree are names of major groups of animals. And I don't want you to get overwhelmed by the names. The message I wanted to take away from this uh, depiction here is that there are many, many different forms of animal life out there. These are the major types of them. And the, uh, what this tree is depicting, so it has branches that then connect to each other. And these connections tell you how these different groups are related to each other. So for example, all of these animals in the blue group are more closely related to each other than they are to the animals depicted in the green uh, lineages or lines or branches. Let me orient you a little bit to the major players on this tree. So this is where we would go. We are a type of vertebrate. Vertebrates include things like fish and salamanders and uh, birds. Things that are surprisingly actually closely related to us are things like sea stars that also go in this blue group here. In the green group, you might be familiar with famous things like flies and spiders. 
or shrimp. And closely related to those are things like earthworms, which are annelids, a type of segmented worm. And other things you might be familiar with from beaches and oceans are hydras or sea anemones and jellyfish that are shown here in these white lineages. So now let's bring back the species I showed you from the previous slide, and I'm going to color code them. The ones that are capable of structural regeneration are going to be marked with uh, magenta color, and the ones that are capable of whole body regeneration are going to be marked in yellow color. So what I'm going to do is indicate now on this tree the presence of these species with different abilities to regenerate, and the tree looks like so. What I hope is immediately apparent to you is that this capacity to regenerate, especially whole body regeneration, is widely distributed across this tree. And you might wonder, well, are all of these animals regenerating in the same ways? Are they using the same genes, the same molecules, the same types of cells? If so, we might finally be able to define these universal principles of regeneration biology. And then maybe we can ask, well, what happens that these universal principles then don't apply to our own bodies? It's also possible now that all of these different species use very, very different mechanisms to regenerate, which would also be a fantastic and cool result, in my opinion, because that would tell us that this challenge of regeneration can be uh, solved again and again and again over the course of evolution. So this question of comparing regeneration across animals with the goal of finding common themes has been around for a long time. In fact, the work of Abraham Tremblay in the 18th century uh, is regarded as the birth of experimental biology. What Tremblay was doing, he was holding little hydras in his hand. So a hydra is a cnidarian. Uh, they're closely related to jellyfish and they have a long body column with tentacles coming out at one end. To explain what Chambly was doing in his hand, I will flip this hydra uh, to orient you to this uh, figure that he drew. And what he was doing was cutting them in half. And he shows you what happens to this fragment of the animal that has the tentacles in figure one on the right. It heals up and it becomes a perfectly functioning hydra again. And the fate of this other fragment is shown in figures two, three, and four over time. And it's showing you that over time, this little fragment will uh, sprout little tentacles and become a perfectly functioning hydra as well. More recently, a famous person by the name of Thomas Hunt Morgan was also very interested in the phenomenon of regeneration. So Morgan was spending a lot of time at Woods Hole in Massachusetts at the Marine Biological Laboratory, collecting these flatworms called planarians and chopping them and wondering for decades about how the animals know to regenerate correctly. And Morgan, after having written an entire book about the topic and written many articles, gave up on the problem because he thought that the problem of regeneration could never be solved. And instead, he went on to win a Nobel Prize for inventing the field of genetics. Uh, luckily for us, times have changed. There are lots and lots of more techniques and approaches available to us so we can come back to this problem of re understanding regeneration with a zest uh, that Morgan didn't apparently have. And so let's go back to this tree. Uh, remember, we go here among vertebrates and Morgan was working here among the platyhelminths, the flatworms. Trembly was working here among the Nidarians, and basically any of these lineages or branches on this tree are perfectly good places to start studying this question of how regeneration works. In my lab, we happen to focus on this lineage shown here in red, which has a hard to pronounce name called the Xenacylomorpha. And because it is hard to pronounce, what I will do is for the rest of the talk, just refer to that whole group as acyls or acyl worms. And to explain to you why this group of worms is important to the question of regeneration, I'm going to now simplify this tree and only show you some of the species that people have studied at the level of cells and genes that are capable of whole body regeneration, such as sea squirts, sea stars, planarian worms, segmented worms, acyls, cnidarians, and sponges, 
uh, and the tree is depicting how they relate to each other and to vertebrates, which is, of course, where we belong. And acils are really interesting because if you look at their position on the phylogenetic tree, they are a sister lineage to all other animals with bilateral symmetry. Uh, so they last shared a common ancestor with things like planarians or us 550 million years ago. So if we study regeneration in ACLs and compare that, what we find to regeneration in planarians or sea stars, we might be able to learn something about a long ago ancestor that existed 550 million years ago. So this brings me to the second part of my talk, which will focus on how we understand the process of regeneration in animals. And I will first actually introduce you to the particular model organism that my lab focuses on. And once we do that, I will introduce you to three big questions about regeneration uh, and highlight some of the data from my lab that addresses these three big questions. So here are the worms. The species we work on uh, is uh, scientifically named Hofstenia miamia, but informally we call them the three banded panther worms. You might appreciate from this small sampling of worms that the reason they are called three banded is that most of them have these three stripes of cream color on the backside of their bodies. And not every worm is identical. Sometimes these stripes are solid. Sometimes they appear more like dots, but they are distinct three bands. The worms are called panther worms uh, because they are voracious mangrove predators. And in fact, we collected them a number of years ago during my postdoctoral research at MIT uh, from a marine pond, Walsingham Pond in Bermuda. So it's a beautiful place. Uh, and here's a picture that my postdoctoral advisor, Peter Dean, who went collecting with me, uh, took of me uh, looking out at the pond at the prospect of collecting the worms. And what you might not appreciate from this picture is that I was very nervous. And this is because I grew up, as uh, Jim pointed out, in a landlocked city, uh, close to a desert. I did not really learn how to swim until very late in life. And to obtain these worms, what we had to do was snorkel out to the back of the pond. Uh, and um, I had, was not a good swimmer and had never snorkeled in my life before, but somehow it worked. Uh, we went out to the back of the pond and collected lots of algae that were growing on the roots of these mangroves. And we stuffed them into Ziploc bags. And we swam those Ziploc bags to the shore. Here they are sitting in a bucket. And the worms are quite small. So you can't really see them in the water or in the algae while you're in the field. So next, what you do is you bring all of this material uh, to a place where you can sit and wait for them to emerge. And we did this at the Bermuda Museum of Natural History where researchers there were very helpful to us. And so we put all of this material in these white plastic tubs and let the material sit for two to three hours. And what happens over time is that the oxygen becomes depleted in the water and the worms looking for more oxygen to breathe crawl to the surface of the water. And that's where we can use a pipette like this to pick them up. Uh, and so that's me sitting in the museum uh, picking out worms. And this is all of the worms we found in two days of collecting. Uh, we had a permit to collect 120 worms from Bermuda, and that is exactly the number we brought back to Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, one April many years ago. Fortunately for us, or unfortunately, depending on how you want to look at it, we have never had to go back because, to, to Bermuda because these worms turned out to be a great laboratory research organism. So now uh, at MIT or in my lab here at Harvard, we keep them in Tupperware. We artif make artificially synthesized seawater where we take dried up ocean salt and mix it with uh, 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 ionized water, deionized water, uh, and the worms live happily. So you can see uh, here, they're quite small. There's a coin here to, uh, to give you some uh, sense of size. So they're about um, six to 10 millimeters long. And here's a video of the worms uh, swimming around in one of these little dishes of water. Another really great surprise we got, uh, in addition to them being able to thrive in lab, is that they reproduced well in lab. So we can complete their life cycle, which means that adult worms lay eggs, which we can actually collect and watch and study. So here's a movie of an embryo of one of these worms developing in after 
nine, eight to nine days of laying, this embryo will hatch into a tiny little juvenile worm, which you can see here in the life cycle. And six to eight weeks after that, it will become sexually mature itself and start making its own offspring. Next, before we talk about regeneration, I want to orient you to the anatomy of the worms to understand what types of cells and structures these worms have if we're now gonna ask what types of organs they can actually regenerate. So here's a, a, a picture that I've shown you before of these worms. Again, these uh, three bands are only visible on the back side of the worm. Uh, there is a pointy shaped tail in the what we would call the posterior of the worm. Now, if I take this worm, which you're looking at from its backside, flip it sideways, and give you a section through the worm looking inside, you can see that at the very top of the worm, at the interior, there is an opening, which is the mouth, which leads into a muscular tube, a pharynx, that the worm uses to bring food in, which then leads into a huge gut cavity. So uh, in this uh, schematic drawing on the right, that pharynx and the gut is depicted in this yellow color. Surrounding the gut, there is a lot of muscle. Uh, we call it the body wall musculature. And further outside of that muscle is uh, this, uh, our skin cells. And they also have a, a really nice uh, uh, nervous system. They have a brain that sits in the uh, close to the mouth of the animal, depicted here in red color. So before we start talking about uh, how we study regeneration, I wanted to show you a video of how we actually cut the worms. And I also brought some props over here. So this is one a plate, uh, just a plastic dish where we would put a worm. Uh, but before that, we would put a little piece of uh, filter paper inside the, inside the dish, pour some seawater in it, and then approach the worm with what we call a blue blade, if you can appreciate it. Just, it just, you could use a razor blade uh, or any other type of sharp knife to do this. And so here's a worm uh, that I'm using a pipette to place into the dish on top of the filter paper. And it's alive. It's trying to run away. It somehow knows uh, that uh, something terrible might happen to it. Uh, and um, so we can sometimes slow the worms down, but we can also cut them uh, at their full speed. So finally, the worm is in position and I cut it right at its middle stripe. Now this seems pretty traumatic, but let me reassure you that the worm recovers from this perfectly fine. In fact, what we're going to get is two worms that are happy little worms um, after cutting them in this way. And this is depicted on this next slide here. So this is a, a, a very similar worm that we cut in half. And you can see if you follow along the, this tail or bottom fragment that the wound heals up really quickly. And within a few days, we see this new outgrowth that doesn't have pigment yet. It looks kind of white. And this is a structure called a blastema because this is where a lot of the new cells and organs are forming. And over time, this worm regenerates all of its missing cell types and resembles the original worm. And the same thing happens to this anterior fragment where it quickly regenerates its pointy shaped tail. And then again, um, what's happening inside of the worm is that all of its cell types, its brain, its muscle, uh, its skin, all of it's coming back. And we now have two perfectly functioning worms again. So now that we have a worm that we can keep in the lab and we can chop them up to study regeneration, what are some questions we, we could ask about regeneration? And you might appreciate just from this image that this Blastema, this unpigmented outgrowth is striking. This is where a whole new brain will grow back. And you might wonder, where does this brain come from? What is the source of all of this new tissue? To start talking, uh, talking about how we address this question, I'm going to introduce you to one of the techniques we use in the lab, where we look at gene expression. So all of the cells in our bodies have uh, different types of genes switched on. My, the cells in my eyes have certain types of genes on. The cells in my fingers have a, a different set of uh, genes turned on. So using this technique, we can mark the cells that are in which a certain gene is active. 
So for example, using this technique, genes that are active in muscle should light up the muscle cells or genes that are active in the gut should light up the gut cells for us. And genes that are active in the brain cells should light up the brain. And on the next slide now, I'm going to show you one of these, uh, the expression of a gene called Peewee. And this is what it looked like. So here is just a full worm for reference. And on this bright pink thing is a worm on which we've done this experiment to mark all of the cells where this gene called Peewee is active. And you can maybe appreciate from, you can see most of the outline of the worm, the very anterior part, the head of the worm doesn't have a lot of the pink color, which means those cells are not there, but you see many of them. And uh, I'll show this in schematic form. There are thousands of these cells in each of these worms. And if we go back to that schematic drawing I've shown you before, these cells are surrounding the space around the gut. And this gene Peewee is special and these cells are special in that we know that they are a type of stem cell, which we now know are making all of the cell types that are coming back during regeneration. So you might look at this slide and say, well, okay, I see the cells. I understand that you have some technique to do this, but how do you know what the purpose of this gene is? How do you know that the cells have this amazing capacity? And so to do that, I will explain yet another technique we utilize in the lab, which is called RNA interference or RNAi for short. And this is how it works. So we imagine a worm that we haven't done anything to. It should have all of its normal organs or cell types inside of it. When we inject into this worm material for peewee RNAi, where we want to prevent the peewee gene from working properly, the cells that normally had peewee will no longer have that gene as active. And then we can cut the worms and ask, does it still regenerate? If peewee was needed for regeneration, if these cells were needed for regeneration, then the worm should not be able to regenerate when it doesn't have any peewee to work with. Now, a very important thing in all of these experiments is to have the right controls. So it could be that just the process of injecting these worms, sticking a needle inside of them messes them up. And then they're not able to regenerate because we hurt them badly. So we do controls where we take the worms through the same process. We inject them with something except with material that we know should not interfere with any of the genes in this animal. So on the next slide, I'll show you, uh, 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 first I'll show you a little video of how we do this in injections. So, uh, but after that, you'll see a slide where we sh I'll show you real data from this type of experiment that shows you the results from the control RNAi and the PV RNAi side by side. And so this is just a very short little video where you can see uh, the worm is impaled at the end of a very fine glass needle uh, where we have uh, also added a pink food coloring to, uh, lay, uh, to show you that we are injecting material. So this is the PV RNAi material. And as I play the video, you'll see that the gut of the worm fills up with this pink material. And the worms survive this process just fine. Uh, uh, within a couple of hours of doing this injection, you cannot even tell where you injected the worms. Okay, so here are the results of this peewee RNAi experiment. So here are worms that were injected either with the control material or the peewee RNAi material and then they were cut. And I'm showing you the top half, the head fragment in the top panel, and then the tail fragment in the bottom panel. So in control RNAi, importantly, the worms do just fine. You can see that the pointy shape of the tail comes back, and this head blastema that is making a brain underneath comes back. In contrast, in the peewee RNAi worms, you can see that the tail does not grow back, and there is no head blastema. So this type of experiment, plus many more, have now told us that peewee and the cells that this gene peewee is active in are needed for regeneration. And here's our model for how this works. Uh, so I'm showing you, going to show you a little animation, which uh, in this drawing, it's depicting the very um, uh, the wound site where we had cut this worm and a new brain is growing. 
And so imagine that right at the, in the body of the worm that was left behind when we cut the worm, which is marked by this red amputation line, there were all of these stem cells, which are called neoblasts. As we cut the worm, they actually turn into all of the other cell types like skin and muscle and neuron and gut cells. And this tells us that these cells overall have really great potential. They have the potential to make all missing cell types. And we use a word called pluripotent to refer to this amazing capacity of these worms. So this is great. And what is even better is that this is not unique to Hopsenia. Turns, I'm going to show you a picture uh, to give uh, as an example from planarians. So planarians are those googly-eyed worms that Thomas and Morgan used to work on. Uh, people uh, have known for a while from planarians also that there is a similar neoblast stem cell population. And in these cells also, peewee, the same gene is required for the worm to be able to regenerate. And if I actually go back to this little tree um, I showed you before with all of these species that are capable of whole body regeneration depicted in relationship to vertebrates, turns out that the vast majority of these species also have in their adult bodies this peewee ex uh, expressing stem cell population. So this is seeming to look like one of these universal principles of regeneration. Um, you'll notice that uh, we don't have a check mark for C stars, so this is work in progress. Um, any of you who are looking to get into research might consider that to be a good question for you to study. The missing check mark for vertebrates actually is not missing data. Truly, our bodies do not have this type of cell. So we do have stem cells, but we have stem cells that are dedicated to very specific functions. So I have stem cells in my hair follicles that can help regrow my hair. I have stem cells in my skin that help heal my skin, but not this type of pluripotent stem cell. And so there is this correlation between having this type of amazing cell and being able to do whole body regeneration. Okay, so let's go back to this um, question I had posed one of the big uh, one big question about regeneration, and we can answer it and say that okay, we know a little bit about where cells come from, and it's from this adult pluripotent stem cell population. Now, as this these stem cells are making lots and lots of new cells, the new ones need to know what type of cells to make. Imagine when in a worm I cut off the head, it needs to make a new brain. But if I cut off the tail, it does not need to make a new brain. How does the worm know what type of cell it needs to make? And that is another big question. How do, the, how do these stem cells, as there's more and more and more of them being made, how do they know what cell type to make? To talk about that, I'll show you the results from uh, RNAi for this gene called WNT, also uh, briefly referred to as WINT. Uh, in, by scientists. And in this experiment, again, we injected control material or wind RNA I material, cut the worms in half. And I'm only going to show you this head fragment where, again, you can see that this tail comes back, but in the, in the controls, but in the wind RNA animals, there's no tail. In fact, there's a little bit of this circly thing. And if I now take this worm and zoom into it, looking at it from its belly side, you can see that this opening here looks a lot like the original mouth of the animal. So this seems to be a two-headed worm. And if you're not convinced, we can actually use our gene assays um, to uh, delve deeper into this uh, worm. And I can show you that definitively, this is a double-headed worm. So here um, you can see that there's this gene that's marked in green color that normally surrounds the mouth, which is in the head of the worm, uh, which you can see in the control worm is only on one side, but in these wind RNAi animals, it's showing up on the other side as well. So here is a double headed animal because the worm, when it regenerated, it made a mistake. Instead of making a tail where it should have made a tail, it made a head and that tells us that these, um, this wind gene uh, makes a signal to the stem cells 
and tells them how to where to put heads and, head and tail tissues in the right place. Here also something striking emerges, which is that this is not unique to the panther worms. We also know this result from planarian worms. So this is the same animal that I just showed you from Hofstania, where you have a double-headed animal. When people do a similar experiment in planarians, where they chop a, a worm on a fragment on both sides, you get a double-headed planarian. I don't know if uh, some of you can see the googly eyed. Uh, the googly eyes are coming back and getting regenerated on this side as well as on the posterior side. So these are double-headed planarians as well. And now if I go back to, again, the same tree we've been using as our reference, turns out that it's not just panther worms, it's not just planarians, but other animals such as the hydra that Trembley was working on also use these wind signals to figure out where head and tail should regenerate. Now, this one you can see, um, we have a lot of missing data. We need to study uh, these wind signals in a lot more species to get at this question of whether this could be one of those universal principles of animal regeneration. Okay, so let's go back to these two questions. Now we can add a little bit of an answer. You know, this is just one of the answers. There are probably many, many other signals involved. We can say that, okay, we know a little bit about some of the signals that these stem cells need to figure out what type of tissue or organ to make. Now, a big piece of this puzzle is how do you get all of this started in the first place? Right, So we know that stem cells are going to make new cells. We know that there are going to be signals telling the stem cells what type of tissues to make. But how do you set off this process? How does the worm know that it needs to start making new tissue? To talk about that, I will uh, focus on a gene called EGR, which um, I'm showing you one of those gene expression experiments where, remember, the, the bright pink color is going to tell you which cells have this EGR gene activated. So in these animals, we cut the worms in half, and I'm only showing you the tail fragment. And you can see a tail fragment at zero hours. It just means we cut the, cut the worm and right away we preserved it uh, before anything could happen. And you see this kind of hazy pink color. Uh, which we were, uh, which just highlights what the shape of the animal is. But within an hour, this gene EGR becomes highly activated in the cells right where we had cut the animal. So it's somehow responding to, um, uh, to, to the amputation. And next we asked whether this gene is important for regeneration. And so we did an RNAi experiment and the results of that are shown here. So the worms were cut in half. In the control injected materials, the worms regenerate just fine. Here's the nice pointy tail. Here's the nice head blastema. But the worms that were injected with EG material for EGR RNAi completely failed to regenerate. And this experiment, together with many other experiments done in the lab, have given us a model for how EGR is working. And it turns out that EGR is a special type of gene which can then actually control other genes. So it acts as a switch that turns on a circuit of many other genes that are important for regeneration. And when we do EGR RNAi, where we mess with its function, EGR can turn on and then the circuit can turn on and then the worm cannot regenerate. And if you've already caught my drift from the previous two questions, you probably expected that I was going to show you the slide, which is that this is not unique to Hofstenia. Just like EGR is turned on very quickly uh, after cutting the worm in Hofstenia, planarians also turn on this gene right away within 30 minutes of, uh, of cutting in this animal as well. And EGR is a type of gene also called an immediate early gene. So we find that actually, going back to the tree, EGR and these other immediate early genes are activated in many systems. 
Now, in Hufstenia, we happen to know a lot about exactly what EGR is doing. Turns out in some of these other systems, we don't quite know what it does. Maybe the sa- it's doing the same thing that it is doing in Hufstenia. And one of the things I want to point out on this slide is this check mark next to vertebrates, because EGR gets activated in our bodies as well when we are injured. And a really important question then is, how is it that in Hofstenia and some of these other animals, EGR can then connect to this full body regeneration, but in our bodies, despite turning on, it does not connect to this capacity for full regeneration. These are big questions we don't have answers to yet. So if we go, go back to this um, schema of the three big questions about regeneration that I promised I will tell you about, uh, Hofstenia, I hope uh, you can see that Hofstenia is giving us answers to many of these questions. And overall, um, this is my last slide, I hope that I've convinced you that this goal of looking for universal principles of regeneration uh, is an important one. And the way we can um, ask that question is to study lots and lots of different species where we get at the question of which genes and which cells are operating in regeneration. And I hope that I've also convinced you that uh, looking at distantly related worms uh, or other types of species, maybe the slug that Jim was telling you about, is an important approach to uncover the fundamental processes that are involved in regeneration. Um, So this is the schema that Hofstenia has given us, some of the clues about how regeneration works uh, in this animal. And I showed you that some of these um, ideas might be parts of these universal principles, but a lot more work needs to be done. We really need to figure out more about how exactly, let's say, EGR connects to these stem cells and also study this in multiple species to truly start uncovering these um, universal principles of regeneration. So um, next, uh, there's a couple things I'm uh, really excited uh, to go uh, to briefly mention here. So Hofstenia, again, is a worm that um, uh, we collected uh, from a marine pond in Bermuda. Not a lot of work had been done on this species, but now it is enabling uh, us to ask questions in a really deep way about the process of regeneration. One of the things we'd really like to do is follow these cells what to mark the cells in live animals and follow them around and see how they work during regeneration. And um, this slide highlights uh, that in Hofstenia, we've now developed this technique called transgenesis, which allows us to light up cells uh, of different types in the worm. So in this worm, all of the muscle cells are glowing green. And in this video, this is an embryo developing where you're watching muscle cells being born dividing, making more of themselves, and then hooking up and connecting to each other to each other to make the entire body wall muscle of this animal. Further, many of you may have heard of this technique called CRISPR, which allows us to make very specific changes in the genome of an animal or other, other organism. And we can also use, use this technique in Hofstenia. So when we guide these sequences that are depicted here in purple arrows, to the genome of Hofstenia, we see very specific changes being made in our animal. So this can then um, enable us to ask a deeper questions about the mechanism of regeneration in our species. Uh, I wanna end by thanking um, many, many, many trainees, postdocs, students, undergraduates who've been involved in this work over the years. Also, uh, all of the folks who were involved in the early uh, parts of this work uh, during my postdoctoral research, uh, as well as all of the uh, agencies that have given us funding to um, study regeneration. Thank you very much. And Jim, I think it's time for us to take some questions. Well done, Monsi. Uh, you got a lot of responses uh, to your talk, all very positive. Uh, many questions. It's going to be a challenge for me to to pick and choose. I think they fall into two, somewhat into two groups. One who one group is asking questions about the details of regeneration in Hofstenia. Others extrapolate your want to extrapolate your results to human reg- and or the absence of regeneration. So why, I'll try to group them. Let's deal with the Hofstenia ones um, first. So uh, let me see, let me find this one here. Uh, Jennifer asks, 
Um, do the worm do the worms always regenerate with the same type of stripes that they had before they were severed? If a worm has solid stripes and you cut it in half, do both segments regenerate with solid stripes or not? That's a great question. And yes, they do mirror the original pattern of the animal. We have reason to believe that the the type of striping or bending pattern they have is under genetic control. And uh, definitely the when you cut a worm in half, the two worms that come out of it are clones of each other. They look similar and they have the exact same genetic material. Well, you're, you're uh, clairvoyant because that was the next question I was going to ask from Chloe wanted to know, are the bisected worms genetically identical after they regenerate? And you've, you've confirmed that. Yep. Okay. I'm curious, another uh, sequel to this is, do you know if they can breed with one another, if they're genetically identical? Uh, yes, they can. So, uh, in fact, a worm can be, so these are hermaphroditic animals, which means one individual will make both sperm and egg. So they tend to cross fertilize. Um, and, and so we can um, uh, pick, you know, we can put two worms together and they will mate with each other. If we cut a worm and make two of two, two clones, they will mate with each other. But also if we leave one worm alone for a long time in a box, it will actually um, mate with itself and make um, uh, start making embryos. It's lonely, a lonely worm. Um, okay, uh, Mary asks, did the new worms resulting from the original cut worm have signs of damage such as scarring? Or were there any differences or were they 100% identical? Uh, this is an excellent question. So generally to the level at which we can study the worms, they do look identical. We do not observe scarring uh, in our worms. And uh, this question about scarring is a really important one because one of the big challenges in human heal wound healing and regeneration is scar formation. So scar formation is good in humans because it prevents us from bleeding out, but then it also prevents regenerative processes, but these worms do not undergo scar formation. Uh, okay, um, here's an interesting one from uh, Ying Yu. Maybe you will address this in your talk. Okay, can the worm's nerve system sense the pain when you cut them? Do you have to consider humane treatment when working with these worms as one might when working with mice? Um, so that's a good question. Um, you know, they they have neurons. We don't really know what pain would mean to uh, to a worm like this. Um, uh, generally, there are lots of regulatory agencies that think hard about this, which is why um, the way we deal with mice or other vertebrate animals is tightly controlled because there is this concern about how the animals are being treated. Generally, uh, with invertebrates, uh, there is um, no real evidence, um, to my knowledge, about their experience of pain. So uh, but the real answer is, I don't know. Uh, but I think people who do think about this stuff uh, so far don't think that that is something we should be concerned about. And, and I think, am I correct in saying that the guidelines that apply that are established by the federal government for this kind of work do not apply to your organisms? Not, not, no, they don't. Okay, we have several questions about neoblasts. You, you've established a neoblast cult. Um, do the neoblasts migrate upon amputation to the places they will act? Great question. This has been well studied in planarians. Uh, the, the, the googly-eyed worms that Morgan worked on. Uh, and yes, people have reported that the we, we see within a couple of days of cutting the worms, you see a much larger number of neoblasts right underneath the wound site. So we do expect that there is some migration going on. In the panther worms, again, this is a newer system, so we have not studied everything in this organism. We don't know yet, but we expect that the, the cells are able to migrate. Okay, a related question from Claire. Are the neoblasts just sitting in the worm prior to the amputation, or does the amputation induce neoblast replication? Both. So they, uh, these worms always have neoblasts hanging out. And actually, in worms that have not been cut or injured, these cells have a purpose. They are 
uh, allowing the animal to constantly replace cells that die for various reasons. So, you know, even in our bodies, we are constantly shedding skin. Most animals have a process like that. So the neoblast would normally just be replacing all of the, the cells that are dying because of natural processes. And upon wounding, they do specifically get activated and make more of themselves. Okay, one more question about uh, neoblasts from James. Are neoblasts the primary cell type responsible for regeneration in ACLs? If one were to culture individual neoblasts, could entire worms or parts of them be regenerated from them? Uh, that's a good question. So um, the neoblasts are, you know, people have tried to culture planarian neoblasts. We have not tried this in Hofstadia yet. So you could imagine it would be very useful to be able to have them in petri plates and study the cells there. Um, we don't expect that a single cell could grow into a whole new worm because it. we know that these stem cells can only work in the context of the other tissues of the animal. So they sort of need a scaffold of the worm to be able to divide and repopulate uh, the, the rest of the animal. So it, the, a neoblast is not necessarily the equivalent of, let's say, an, uh, a zygote, which is the single-celled entity that all of us started out as. Um, but um, neoblast culturing definitely is an uh, important goal that people have been wanting um, to get to work over the years. Great. Okay, let's switch to um, questions about other species and comparisons. Here's one. Here's a wonderful question from Maria. I'll read it entirety. Presenter was amazing, exclamation point. I am watching this with my kids, seven and nine, and they loved it too. Thank you for offering this. Are there any worms that live in Massachusetts that regenerate? The kids now want to go worm hunting and chop their heads. They should. There are planarians <laughs> everywhere. You can go to any uh, stream, creek, riverbed, and start turning over rocks. You just have to have a, a little bit of patience and good, you know, waterproof shoes. And um, you, you will, uh, you know, within uh, minutes, usually in the summertime, as you turn over rocks, uh, my three year, uh, when my daughter was three years old, she turned over five rocks and found a worm right away. So uh, this is possible, and I highly encourage it. Excellent. Uh, Vivian asks, do hammer-headed worms regenerate too? Um, so I am not familiar with hammer-headed worms. Um, but They're planarians, so I, I believe. So not all planarians regenerate. So uh -huh. I, I don't know is the real answer. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, now, here's a, here's a question. I apologize for triggering this. Um, I'm, do you, is it possible for you to bring up your phylogeny again? Because uh, Linda asks, I wonder where the sea slugs show up on the tree you showed. Sure. So sea slugs would be our mollusks. They would go right here, close to the segmented worms in the green lineages. Uh, okay. And, and the fact that you didn't talk about them on your reduced... Uh, phylogeny means that basically nothing is known about the so, genetic basis of regeneration in them? Right. So we just don't, people, we don't have systems yet. People are, uh, some colleagues of mine are now starting to do this in the lab. There just have not been very good systems in the lab that where you could study the genes and cells. Okay. Uh, okay. So in, um, in a series of questions that pertain to vertebrates or humans, if peewee cells were injected into vertebrates, would they aid in regeneration, especially of the nervous system? This comes from Annette. Yeah, so I am, um, you know, generally there's just a technical challenge with taking cells from one organism and putting them into another, right? So we can't, um, uh, you know, the, the, the cells of the organism we study, uh, which is a marine organism, are used to a completely different environment than our cells. So that probably won't work. But I think the, the root of the question is whether we could endow uh, human cells with the same capacity that we observe in these peewee stem cells and these other systems, whether uh, that would help us regenerate. 
And that I think is at the crux of human regenerative medicine. The reason the NIH funds research in all these different organisms is so that we could learn um, how is it that these stem cells can stay in a pluripotent state. So in our, you know, in humans, we did have pluripotent cells, but only when we were very early embryos within the first, you know, week of our life, we have those types of cells, but progressively as more and more parts of our body form, we lose those pluripotent stem cells. So the people are definitely researching how one could use uh, human pluripotent cells for regenerative medicine. And in fact, um, in 2006, there was a Nobel Prize winning discovery where they found that there is a way for us to take a cell from my body and put it in a Petri dish and turn it into a pluripotent stem cell. And uh, so those are not PV cells, but that's a different way to endow pluripotency on human cells. So that's great. Here's, I, I think you've already answered this question. I'll ans ask it anyway from Forrest. But humans have pluripotent stem cells as embryos. When do we lose that capacity? Yeah, pretty early in embryonic development. As soon as uh, the different layers of our, uh, of, of our body, the ectoderm, the endoderm, and the mesoderm start forming, we lose the pluripotent cells. Okay, and a... Uh, I think you've already may have already answered this, but I'll answer it from Wilson. Are pluripotent cells from Hofstenia transferable to humans? Yeah, no, but just for technological reasons, right? Just um, very, you know, salt water versus human mm -hmm. body are very different environments. Uh, let's see. Okay, we have a question here from Ada, who is five. I missed this earlier. Let me just ask it. If you cut the worms in several pieces, will they all still regenerate? Excellent question. Yes, they will. So in planarians are famous for, um, and I think it was Thomas Hunt Morgan who did this experiment where he cut them into 279 or 80, 280 or so pieces and each worm piece still regenerated. Uh, in Hofstenia, we haven't gone that far. Uh, we will take a conscientious five-year-old who wants to do this in our lab to come and do it someday. Um, but yes, we can cut the worms in three, four pieces. We can. We don't have to just cut them in that sort of bisecting way. You could cut them diagonal, sideways, many different ways, and they will recover. Um, okay, not human, but is from uh, Camila. Is gecko regeneration any different from the regeneration process of Hofstenia? Um, yeah, so we are only now starting to study lizard regeneration at that level of um, molecular and cellular detail. Uh, the, we know that most likely there are not going to be pluripotent stem cells involved. We know from studies in other vertebrates such as salamanders and newts that when in that video of the salamander uh, arm that was regrowing, what happens is the, the, the cells that are left behind in the stump that are already muscle cells or skin cells, they de-differentiate um, and they start dividing and then they just make more, the skin cells divide and make more skin cells, the muscle cells divide and make more muscle cells, et cetera. Uh, and there is no pluripotent stem cell involved there. All right. Now, some of your colleagues in the museum, you, you've got some ringers here. They're, they're tossing in their comments. So here's one from Hopi. Why do some organisms have the ability to regenerate and others don't? What do you think are the ultimate drivers of regeneration? Excellent question. I think it's uh, this question is people think about it in different contexts, right? So some people think about it from the context of fitness and ecological pressures. So, you know, it seems like it would be very useful to be able to regenerate. And maybe the organisms that are able to regenerate have some benefit to having that property. Um, except that we also find very closely related species that have very different capacities to regenerate. So like I mentioned, there are planarians, some that regenerate and some that don't, and they don't have very different uh, ecological pressures. So uh, that's one way um, some people think about it from an immune system perspective, that vertebrates, for example, uh, we have a really good immune system, 
um, which is something I guess we've all been thinking about a lot these days in particular. And um, uh, th some of the, pr uh, th the work of our immune system actually gets in the, would get in the way of regeneration. And some of these other animals don't have such robust immune systems as vertebrates do. So maybe that's why they are more able to regenerate. So I think we have a lot of just so explanations um, that are offered by people thinking about it from different perspectives. I do not have definitive answers on that. Uh, okay, are you willing to take a few more, Monty? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, a couple of questions here having to do with longevity of panther worms, given that they can regenerate. Here, I'll ask two of them. Joseph says, do they live forever? And Christina asks, how long do both worms live if you cut it in half? Good question. So I would say that probably in, in real life, nothing is immortal, right? But most things get eaten or get sick, right? But I would say that technically, I think our worms could be immortal. Uh, of course, I've never, I haven't lived on this planet long enough to really prove that to you. But um when we keep them in good conditions, um, feed them well, and don't let them get sick, we just see them live on and on and on. We still have some worms um, that I collected from Bermuda 11 years ago, right? Um, so potentially, they, you know, in, in a way, they could be immortal. Um, but I think we need to do specific tests of that question. Now, here's an interesting uh, question from Jennifer. How did you come to choose this species to study in the first place? Um, that's an excellent question. So uh, we were interested in the group of worms, the Xenocylomorpha, right? Because of where they are located on that uh, evolutionary tree that I showed you. But the particular species uh, we learned about uh, from um, uh, 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 Professor Ulf Jundelius, who works at the Swedish Museum of Natural History. And uh, his work has been to look at a seal species all over the world to find new ones, find out how, how they live and where they live. Uh, and, and he made a recommendation to us that because they were able to collect these worms um, from not very deep water, and then when they were studying the worms, they found that inside of their gut, they had shrimp uh, that one could be able, one might be able to keep them in the lab. So based on an expert taxonomist recommendation, we went out to the field to look for this particular species. And are you planning to look at any other species? I mean, are you to start as a new model organism? But uh, definitely in good time. I think, you know, one of the choices I faced, uh, one of the challenges I think any biologist faces is um, you can either study lots of species, but not be able to go in as much depth at the molecular and cellular level, or you can focus on one or a few and then go in a lot of depth. So I would say that in the early part of my research program, because of how exciting Hofstenia has been as a new system, uh, we chose to go in depth and develop a lot of techniques to be able to study regeneration. But now we're in a better position to take that knowledge and apply it to newer, uh, newer species and other systems. Okay, why don't we take one more? We've got many questions here. I apologize to those of you who are not going to be able to get your questions, but I'm going to suggest you write to Monsi. Um, and we'll send her an email and she'll answer all your questions. Here's one from Robert. This will be our last one. Uh, sorry if I missed this, but it seems like many of the whole body regenerators are aquatic. Are there examples of terrestrial whole body regenerators? It's a good one. Let me think. Um... So, I mean, I think there are... Um... I mean, there are definitely extensive regenerators. Uh, so things like earthworms can grow good chunks of their bodies. They can do every single missing cell type. Uh, so those are terrestrial and they can do it, but you're right. A good number of examples that I've been giving you are aquatic, indeed. Well, I think we'll stop it here. Let me on behalf of everyone, Monsi, let me thank you for a very a fascinating talk, very well presented. You covered some very complex topics and made them very palatable for all of us. So thank you very much. And uh, thank you all for attending uh, you who are in the audience. And again, thanks to the suits for sponsoring all of this. And I wish everyone a good evening.
Yes, thank you so much, Jim. Uh, thanks to the HMSC for giving me this opportunity and thank all of you for being engaged listeners. I can see from the many thoughtful questions um, that um, people were listening. So I appreciate that. And as Jim said, if there are questions, uh, please feel free to find my email and um, send me an email.